Good morning, East Coast, West Coast, and our friends around the world. Thank you so much for joining us for another month of the fellow webinar series. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Eckhouse, my co-moderator, uh, the rock star that she is for joining me this morning, as well as our presenters. A couple of housekeeping tips. Um, please remember to apply to the fellows for your candidate membership for ASMBS. Now is a great time to do that. Also a reminder that we're gonna be having ASMBS weekend in San Antonio. It's gonna be a fantastic weekend. There will be a FPD course for any attendings that are listening in and want to get their focus practice de designation. There will also be um, a weekend full of learning as well as the ASMBS Leadership Academy for our fellows. Moving on to this morning, we have two phenomenal speakers today. I would like to introduce Drs. Patty and Dr. Matar. Um, we're going to be having a talk. Dr. Patty is going to talk with us about hypoglycemia after bariatric surgery, as well as vitamin deficiencies. And Dr. Matar is going to talk to us from a kind of a global approach about failure to thrive after bariatric surgery. I'll begin by introducing both of our speakers. We'll begin with Dr. Patty and then round it up with Dr. Matar. Dr. Patty is an investigator at Jocelyn Diabetes Center, an adult endocrinologist and director of the hypoglycemia clinic co-director of the Molecular Phenotyping Corps, and associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Patty's NIH-funded laboratory studies are focused on identification of molecular and epigenetic mechanisms by which environmental and nutritional risk factors during early life confer risk for diabetes. Her laboratory utilizes cellular and animal models to show how parental and early life exposures impact the epigenome and impact diabetes risk in subsequent generations. Clinical and translational studies are focused on the role of the intestine as a mediator of systematic glucose metabolism, I'm sorry, systemic glucose metabolism and its alterations after bariatric surgery and the development of novel approaches to treatment of post-bariatric hypoglycemia. Dr. Patty received her MD from Jefferson Medical College, magna cum laude. She completed internal medicine residency at the University of Pittsburgh and endocrinology fellowship at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Patty has held numerous leadership roles in the diabetes scientific community, including service as organizer of a diabetes-focused Keystone Symposium and chair of the American Diabetes Association Scientific Sessions Planning Committee. She was elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation in 2009, Association of American Physicians in 2022, and to fellowship in both the American College of Physicians and Obesity Society in 2014. Having said all that, I'm not quite sure when Dr. Patty sleeps, but we are more um, than delighted to have her here with us today. <laughs> Dr. Oh. Matar, oh, I'm sorry. Go. Dr. Matar is Professor of Surgery and Chief of the Weight Loss and Metabolic Surgery Division at Baylor College of Medicine, where he is also Mentorship Director. Prior, he was Medical Director at Swedish Medical Center Weight Loss Ser Service in Seattle, Washington. He has held senior faculty positions at Oregon Health Science University and at Indiana University, where he developed successful comprehensive bariatric programs. He is also past president of the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgeons and past president of the Fellowship Council. His practice is almost entirely bariatric in nature, and his main clinical interests are in the area of standardizing pathways and optimizing patient outcomes. He also has an interest in the surgical and endoscopic treatment of acid reflux disease. He has developed comprehensive bariatric and metabolic programs with an emphasis on modern, high-quality, and compassionate care that squarely places the patient at the center. He has published numerous articles and book chapters in the field, and he enjoys teaching and advocating for his patients. Thank you both so, so much for joining us. Um, we'll begin with Dr. Patty's talk. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm happy to be joining you this morning, um, even though as an internist, I'm not used to getting up or being at work quite this early. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So um, I'm just going to get right to it. Um, as we all know, glucose metabolism is profoundly altered by upper gastrointestinal surgery. And this is uh, most notable in the case of the profound efficacy of bariatric surgery, for example, to cause remission of type 2 diabetes, reduction in medication need, and decreased complications of diabetes. So that's all awesome. and um, but 
At the same time, um, there are some patients where they may start with optimal glucose metabolism and as a result of surgery, actually shift to an undesirable um, aspect of a glucose metabolism, namely uh, hypoglycemia. So uh, hypoglycemia is increasingly recognized as a complication of many upper GI surgical procedures, not only a gastric bypass, but also sleeve gastrectomy, as well as fundoplication, esophagectomy, other esophageal surgeries, and uh, rarely used Bilroth 1 and 2. I don't have on the picture here, but also biliopancreatic diversion or duodenal switch can also cause hypoglycemia. So what is post-bariatric hypoglycemia? So if you learn nothing else today, these are kind of the key points that you should be aware of. When we refer to this condition, it's really documented hypoglycemia on a venous blood sample at the time of symptoms of hypoglycemia and that the symptoms are relieved by correction of the glucose. It usually starts between one to three, but sometimes even more years after surgery. I have patients who didn't really get symptoms of hypoglycemia until 10 years post-op or more. Um, and it's usually postprandial, one to three hours after eating, um, more likely and more severe after simple carbohydrates or especially liquid carbohydrates. But increasingly, we're observing that it can also occur in additional um, time periods, such as in response to exercise and during overnight hours, like the middle of the night, like 2 to 4 a.m. But it doesn't typically occur after an overnight or more prolonged fast. If it's mild, it can be considered a late component of so-called dumping syndrome. Um, and mild cases are responsive to changes in diet, which limit simple carbohydrates and avoid liquids with meals. But a subset of patients have quite severe hypoglycemia, which requires the assistance of others. And these people have such severe hypoglycemia that they have neuroglycopenia or impaired brain function. And this can lead to seizures, falls, loss of consciousness, and motor vehicle accidents. And in these people, they often have, they become unaware so that they don't have any warning symptoms and they just uh, have neuroglycopenia as their first symptom. And this is really uh, a safety issue. This can lead to job and income loss, cognitive dysfunction, loss of driving privileges and disability. And these patients often require both nutrition therapy and multiple medications to try to achieve safety. The treatment is really focused on reducing glycemic excursions, but unfortunately, no matter what treatment we use, it's not likely to eliminate all hypoglycemia. We're just trying to improve safety. So what does this look like? So here's sort of a um, representative tracing to show a couple of key points. This is a, um, a, a glucose a continuous glucose monitor, which measures glucose every five minutes. We use this to identify patterns. So here's an example of a patient. Here's sort of the normal range in the green. Um, and what you can see is that this patient is in the normal range overnight. They eat a meal, the glucose rises. Within a couple of hours, the glucose falls. They treat, the glucose rises again, falls again, et cetera. I want to emphasize that we don't use this um, continuous glucose monitoring for diagnosis as it's less accurate in low ranges, but um, nevertheless, it's helpful to look at patterns. So here's an example of a patient I saw recently where it's even more striking. So again, normal range is between this lower orange dotted line and the red line below. That's normal range for people without diabetes. Um, and what you can see for this individual is that after eating, there are these huge spikes. So this is up to two, a glucose of 275, followed by a drop below 70. Um, they treated, it went up again to 250, down to about 50, and so on. So really a roller coaster. And this is very dis disheartening, uh, distressing to patients, lots of symptoms, disruption of life. Um, and that's why, you know, thinking about the roller coaster is when we look at these kind of patterns. And patients will often uh, mention that as well. Here's an example when we quantify glucose values over 24 hours, 7% of all sensor glucose readings were under 55. And that's a lot because the normal is under 1%.
So what are the symptoms? Well, they can be uh, adrenergic, uh, activation of the sympathetic nervous system, such as tremor, palpitations, and anxiety, cholinergic, like sweating, Ooh. hunger, paresthesias. But of course, as I mentioned, the more severe and concerning ones are neuroglycopenia, weakness, difficulty concentrating, seizure, coma. And then for some patients, the most severely affected patients, they're not aware. They don't have any warning. So this is really dangerous. This is usually associated with frequent low blood sugars. They lose warning. Um, and it can be also worse if there's been prior exercise or if it's occurring in, when they're sleeping. Sometimes clues can in, um, to the possibility that they're having nocturnal hypoglycemia can be nightmares or bizarre dreams or morning headaches. But again, these symptoms are nonspecific, um, not necessarily hypoglycemia. So you need to prove whether it is indeed hypoglycemia. So why is it so important? Well, neurons require glucose. We all know that, that it, when glucose levels fall, brain function is impaired. And so, you know, neuronal death can occur with very uh, low levels of glucose. But, you know, the, most of our patients with post-bariatric hypoglycemia have glucoses that are often in the 50s and even in the 40s. And even though brain death hasn't occurred, fortunately, um, there can be uh, brain um, decreased cognition and uh, seizures, et cetera. So let me just put this into a little bit more practical. This is another patient of mine who um, uh, was found unresponsive in her car after driving into the median of the highway and she hit the guardrail and she awoke shortly thereafter and was hospitalized. Fortunately, she didn't have any serious injuries but her car was demolished and she lost her license, of course. But you can see here that her glucose fell to um, pretty significantly low levels um, in the 50s. So serious events do happen, not with everyone. Of course, there's a range of severity, but it can be a very serious illness. So unfortunately, hypoglycemia, once it's recurrent, can then provoke a vicious cycle where recurrent bouts of hypoglycemia cause uh, autonomic failure and reductions in counter-regulatory responses and awareness. So this can increase the likelihood of even more hypoglycemia. So it, it it's, can be very difficult. Moreover, from a patient perspective, people become afraid of hypoglycemia. It can induce a secondary eating disorder because they're afraid of eating. They become afraid of exercise. Quality of life is really substantially reduced. They feel like they're not independent anymore. It can contribute to family stress, job performance problems, um, and uh, cognitive loss over time. We've just, in a small study that we're submitting, have found this, and that's consistent with the data for recurrent hypoglycemia and diabetes. So what's going on in these people? Okay, so to understand this condition, you really need to understand the patterns of postprandial glucose metabolism. So let me walk you through this. This is um, a mixed meal tolerance test. Uh, in three groups of patients. And on the y-axis is the glucose and on the x-axis is the time. So the meal was consumed at time zero. And you can see in a non-surgical patient who is um, obese, um, the glucose rises and falls gradually. But in the patients who have had uh, gastric bypass in this uh, example, um, there's a marked spike in glucose after uh, the meal. And in the patients who don't have hypoglycemia, the spike is accompanied by a rapid drop, but the glucose levels out to and returns to baseline in the dotted line here. But in the patients who have hypoglycemia, this rapid drop continues and the glucose falls to below the starting point. Um, so that's a really distinct uh, pattern, the spike and rapid drop and then hypoglycemia within two to three hours usually. So what's going on at the same time? So the left-hand panel is the same picture we just looked at, but on the right are some of the hormonal changes that are occurring. So firstly, um, you can see that after the meal, the insulin levels spike up in the surgical patients. And you can see here in the white circles that insulin levels are quite high in the surgical patient, but even higher in the patients who have hypoglycemia. Um, and 
This is associated with increases in glucose absorption, as well as tenfold higher levels of GLP-1 than the control non-surgical patient. There actually is a rise here. This is the normal response in gray at the bottom, but you can see that these levels in the patients with post-bariatric hypoglycemia are extremely high. So how do we put this all together? Well, this is an example of both gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. Nutrients are delivered rapidly to the uh, intestine. This leads to an early and high peak of glucose, more secretion of GLP-1. Both of those together cause increases in insulin secretion, especially in the postprandial state, leading to hypoglycemia. So that's really the, you know, this is a simplified version of the pathophysiology, but that's really what you need to know to uh, figure out what to do. I also want to emphasize that beta cell mass is not the problem. Um, this is not a beta cell problem. Uh, partial pancreatectomy does not cure hypoglycemia. And the best example of this is that insulin secretion is normal if you deliver nutrients through a G tube that you know delivers nutrients through the normal route. So don't blame the pancreas. And as a result, don't remove the pancreas because you're just often creating more problems um, than benefits. So insulin dynamics and secretion are abnormal, not the pancreas itself. It's not a beta cell mass problem. Unfortunately, um, everyone who has gastric bypass uh, has reduction in counter-regulatory hormones. And these may be good for improving glycemic control, for example, in people with diabetes, but not uh, but can also contribute to hypoglycemia. There's a reduction in glucagon, cortisol, um, and epinephrine in response to falling glucose, uh, as in the study here of people who were six months post-op. And finally, I just want to introduce you to another concept that the bile acid FXR and FGF19 axis is also perturbed in patients with hypoglycemia. And I won't take time to go through this, but we are, you know, we and others are pursuing um, additional studies to really define the role of this pathway as a mediator of hypoglycemia. There's many other things that I haven't talked about, and that's that um, there's impaired suppression of insulin secretion, abnormalities in clearance of insulin, changes in glucose metabolism, um, changes in the microbiome, um, and others. And not essential to understand from a clinical management perspective. So what are the key points that I would like to convey to you guys? Um, can we prevent? Well, I really do think we have to assess risk preoperatively. And you know, we have emerging data now published that we can understand who's at higher risk. These include female sex, people without diabetes preoperatively, prior cholecystectomy, younger age, lower BMI in the range, family history of hypoglycemia or multiple endocrine neoplasia or insulinoma, long QT interval. Well, you know, you're not gonna exclude female patients or patients without diabetes from bariatric surgery, of course. So I think the most important thing is to ask this question. Have you ever been told or have you, do you, have you, thought that you might have hypoglycemia because a preoperative history of hypoglycemia symptoms in many studies has been shown to be um, associated with increased risk. And I would also urge you to uh, mention hypoglycemia as a complication. And if that's brought up in the discussion, that also may trigger patients to say, oh, I was told once that I did have hypoglycemia already. So maybe uh, important to ask the patient. Um, so we, you know, we're continuing to identify better predictive factors, but this is what we have right now. Okay, so I'm going to end with a few minutes on um, um, management. So I want to emphasize that we can't use glucose monitoring, we can't use symptoms to um, define hypoglycemia. Um, why is that? Because lots of things are very similar. Anxiety can cause palpitations uh, and symptoms that are very similar to hypoglycemia because it's all about adrenergic symptoms. So we need 
um, blood samples. Um, uh, and we need to make sure we need to differentiate whether this is hypoglycemia or if this is dumping. So um, I would refer you to this review article um, that was published in JCNM. Um, but I want to emphasize a couple of things. We want to know what the glucose level is during symptoms. If it's over 70, it's not likely to be due to hypoglycemia. It might be due to dumping, anxiety, uh, cardiovascular disorders like arrhythmias. So I think that even as a surgeon, you might want to help get the process started by prescribing a home glucose meter and asking the patient to check when they're feeling symptoms. And if it's consistently over 70, maybe it's dumping, maybe it's something else, and a referral to the dietitian to go re reinforce uh, dietary changes for dumping would be something very important. If it's, um, oops, um, if the glucose is under 70, that's when you may want to consider referring to the endocrinologist for additional, um, uh, additional workup. Um, because there are other factors that can cause hypoglycemia, even in a bariatric patient. And the, the job of the endocrinologist is to rule out these other causes of hypoglycemia, such as adrenal insufficiency, autonomous insulin secretion like insulinoma, et cetera. So um, consider prescribing glucose meters, referral to dietitians. Um, medications can make hypoglycemia worse. A lot of our patients are on tramadol, gabapentin, antidepressants. They can make things worse. And of course, talk to patients about alcohol. So finally, our goals of therapy are not to cure this. We don't have a cure right now. We are just trying to improve safety, improve awareness, and our <coughs> therapy is designed to reduce post-meal glycemic spikes. Um, so CGM use can be helpful, but not usually covered by insurance, but can be uh, helpful, particularly in patients who are unaware and they can see what their glucose is and when it's falling. So the cornerstone of treatment is medical nutrition therapy. So I think these two pictures illustrate this. Here's on the left, someone on a standard diet with these huge spikes and troughs. And then on the right, in response to a controlled carbohydrate diet, there's a marked reduction in both highs and lows. And so this is really important. Um, control, avoid intake of simple carbohydrates, controlled portions of complex carbohydrates, but not total carbohydrate elimination. We're not talking about a keto diet here um, because that can actually worsen hypoglycemia. Okay, and then I would really feel strongly that a surgical practice should become comfortable with using acarbose as the first step. So acarbose is um, a medication taken orally, which slows carbohydrate absorption. And what you can see here on the left is that in the dotted line, uh, a meal that where acarbose was taken before the meal has a marked reduction in the postprandial glucose spike. As a result of that reduction in the glucose spike, there's a reduction in insulin and GLP-1 uh, levels. And as a result of that, there's less of a fall in glucose compared to the meal without the acarbose. So this is a very benign drug. It's uh, very easy to use. Um, you start with 25 milligrams 20 minutes before meals, and you can go up to 100 milligrams. It's often limited by gas, bloating, um, but it's really very well tolerated with, other than those GI side effects, um, very few problems. So I would encourage surgical practices to, you know, start a carbose, and then if things don't get better, to refer to the endocrinologist. I won't go through this in detail, but here's some other medications that we use somatostatin analogs such as octreotide, which decreases both incretin and insulin secretion and can also be helpful for dumping. Um, diazoxide, which decreases insulin secretion. We sometimes use CGMs, as I told you. Sometimes we add cornstarch, which can be uh, thought of as a slow-release carbohydrate, correct nutritional deficiencies. There are other medications that haven't really stood the test of uh, 
controlled studies, but are uh, anecdotally effective. And then if they really are one of the very severe patients, we reassess the diagnosis. We consider G-tube feeding into the remnant stomach or into a J-tube. Reversal of surgery when feasible. This is not 100% effective, but can be helpful uh, in very severe cases. And as I said, not pancreatectomy. Um, so let me uh, spend a couple minutes on vitamins. Um, you know, I think patients, I see patients many years after surgery, and many of them are not taking anything. They're, get, they, they're confused. I didn't think I had to take them anymore. They cost too much money. What am I supposed to do? So which vitamins to check? There are guidelines from the ASMBS and published in SWORD in 2020, for example. But the ones that I really think are important to really focus on um, I'll just briefly mention vitamin B1, especially in those patients who have recurrent nausea and vomiting and, and rapid weight loss, alcohol use, and malnourished, especially in the first year. And this is really important because that can contribute to um, cognitive dysfunction, encephalopathy, and long-term neuropathy. So that's um, a very important um, vitamin to look for. I see a lot of B12 deficiency, mostly with gastric bypass, but also sleeps, more likely in someone with metform on metformin or a PPI. This can cause neuropathy, uh, anemia, gait disturbances, so uh, can be quite severe. Uh, folate um, can be seen, deficiency can be seen in all bariatric patients. Similarly, iron deficiency can contribute to anemia and fatigue. And if it's severe enough, IV infusion may be required. And vitamin D and calcium are also quite commonly deficient. And remember that we have to use both vitamin D and calcium. If you only supplement vitamin D, you can still have impaired, um, uh, inadequate calcium. And uh, both of these can lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism and reduced bone density in our patients. Um, and finally, vitamin A, E, and K, the fat-soluble vitamins are less commonly um, encountered. Zinc and copper are increasingly recognized as deficiencies, which can contribute to a lot of other uh, side effects, including anemia and neuropathy. So um, I'll leave you with that and say thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions later. Thank you so much. Dr. Matar? Yes, thank you. Let's see if I can share my screen. Can you share, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, well, thanks again for this opportunity. Uh, I, I'm really uh, very appreciative and I'm very impressed also with the number of, uh, uh, of fellows that have joined us. Uh, I, I think this is a great initiative and certainly uh, I'm hoping it's also appreciated by the fellows. It's a great opportunity to learn from others. Uh, these are my disclosures. They have uh, really no impact on what I'm about to talk about. So the topic I was given to discuss it was a, a little broad, if I may say, and it was essentially uh, uh, what to do with patients who had either oral intolerance um, or aversion to food. And also, of course, we have that special group of patients who have uh, chronic abdominal pain of indeterminate origin. Uh, so I'll start off with uh, PO intolerance, which we see quite often. And I think uh, maybe 80% of the management can be planned just from listening to the patient. Uh, of course, you have to ask some leading questions. And uh, most importantly, these are some of the questions that I ask patients when I encounter them. Uh, of course, I ask them what kind of operation did they have? Were there any complications? Was it straightforward? Um, um, what, what is the time interval from surgery? And not only with regards to their 
current visit, but when the symptoms started, did they have they had intolerance ever since the operation, or did they have a period of normal digestion, so to speak, and then did these uh, issues start developing? Um, when they say that they can't tolerate food, I think we need to get a little more granular and ask them. Uh, is it liquids uh, or is it liquids and solids? And if it is solids, what kind of food? Is it all kinds of food or specific uh, groups of food? Um, also, uh, obviously, like uh, any other physician uh, would do is ask about associated symptoms. Is there heartburn? Uh, are, they, uh, find, are, are they experiencing any dysphagia? nausea or pain when they swallow and when they eat. And then if they do have any of these symptoms, again, it's important to determine the time interval between actually ingesting the food and the rise of these symptoms. And as usual, we ask uh, what medications they might be on that might have as a side effect uh, nausea or anorexia that is quite common uh, in our patients. If, if they are uh, vomiting or regurgitation, I think we need to delve a little bit deeper into that and ask them exactly, uh, do they feel that they are regurgitating what they've just ingested or is it vomiting after a while of either food or, or undigested food? And then what is the characteristic of the emesis? Is it frothy saliva? As you know, that might indicate a stricture. Uh, is it undigested food, same thing, or achalasia? Uh, is it bilious? And usually, uh, I think every bariatric surgeon in the audience here knows that if a patient complains of bilious vomiting, especially after uh, intestinal surgery like uh, gastric bypass, um, then you have to seriously consider that uh, there is an anatomic problem and that you have to take the patient to the operating room. Um, so you can see that a lot of information can be learned from just the first five, 10 minutes of encountering the patient. And then you look at them and you see how ill they are. Are they dehydrated? Uh, do they have a fever? Is there point tenderness in their abdomen? Are they guarding or jaundiced? Uh, all these are uh, potential signs of an underlying disease process that might be driving these symptoms. And in terms of uh, studies for these patients, I, I, I typically obtain a, a labs, including uh, liver function tests, which you have to purposely uh, request. Endoscopic assessment of uh, the bariatric uh, operation, whichever it might be, whether it's an EGJ or an EGD, uh, I think uh, uh, all bariatric surgeons should have this uh, uh, access to the endoscopy room and conduct these studies themselves so that they can see, especially if this is their own patient, to see um, how um, the landmarks, uh, what the pouch looks like or the sleeve looks like, whether there's any esophagitis or any other anatomic abnormalities. Um, and sometimes uh, I will often, uh, if I see a little bit of a narrowing, but it's not a true stricture, I will empirically dilate. And, you know, it does have a, a placebo effect. Uh, patients will tell me that they feel a whole lot better and uh, actually improves their oral intake. And in terms of imaging, I always get an upper GI. It's a nice roadmap of, uh, of the operation, allows me to see how the esophagus is working, if there's a hiatus hernia, what the sleeve looks like or pouch and so on, and whether there's any obstruction to the, uh, to the distal flow of the contrast along the intestines. CT abdomen, ultrasound liver, gallbladder, and a high desk scan. I'll, if, if all these above are negative, I will often get a high desk scan because it gives me a, an idea of what the, of the, of the flow of the bile uh, and whether there are any issues, not only with the gallbladder, but with the biliopancreatic limb. Um, you, you might encounter the occasional case of a RU on O and not a RU on Y. And then if all else is negative and you're still scratching your head and the patient is either in pain or intolerant, we go ahead and schedule a diagnostic laparoscopy. And this can be both diagnostic and therapeutic, even if it's negative. 
again, it has occasionally a placebo effect where uh, patients feel better after you've rearranged or, or manipulated their intestines. Um, I think uh, the important thing is, you know, to, to realize that these are patients who are truly suffering. The majority of them uh, are, uh, are genuinely uh, in distress. And uh, we can sometimes uh, feel impatient because as surgeons, uh, we, we like to get a diagnosis and treat it. Um, we, we like the gratification. Uh, but these are patients who are probably going to be under your care for a long time. And so they need a lot of compassion, a lot of sympathy. And not only by yourself, but the entire team, the entire staff have to provide a lot of support to these patients because it will usually be a long process. Now, I, I've added here a, a list of antiemetics. Uh, we usually start with the common ones. But for those patients who have chronic nausea, and I know you've all encountered these patients, it's usually more common in younger females, again, with a lower end of the BMI spectrum. Um, we'll go through these one after the other and sometimes in combination. Um, and um, I've actually used this cannabinoid therapy with uh, some degree of success from time to time. But number one is actually one of the most important antiemetic measures that you can do, because as you know, dehydration can itself cause nausea, and then the patients enter into this vicious cycle. And sometimes just bolusing them with a couple of liters um, will, will improve their symptoms. As Dr. Pitt, uh, sorry, as Dr. Uh, Patty mentioned, it's important to check for thiamine and other vitamins because uh, these can cause permanent damage if uh, not addressed. Um, we ask the patient uh, to uh, start uh, documenting in a food diary um, because th they may actually be underestimating how much they're eating and drinking. Um, so it's nice to actually document everything and then go over it with them, uh, either by yourself or with a dietitian. A lot of these patients also, uh, as I said, have anxiety. Uh, they might have uh, stress uh, at home that might be uh, either driving some of these symptoms or the result of some of these symptoms. So it's always helpful to have a psychologist on board. And finally, we, uh, there's a lot to gain from just discussing the patient in a multidisciplinary setting with all the members of your team, including the nursing staff. Uh, to see how you can help the patient and the family. Um, and if all else fails, uh, there's always a TPN available or enteral feeding, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Patty mentioned, with a possible G-tube or a, a orogastric or orojejunal tube. And for those patients who have chronic pain, uh, I will sometimes consult pain management as well, uh, because um, uh, we all need uh, occasional uh, advice from other experts. So the final word uh, with regards to the oral intolerance is to be patient. These are not patients who are going to recover overnight over, or over a week, uh, you know, get used to the fact that it will be a long haul. Um, also, the, uh, there, uh, there was a... Uh, uh, a request to talk about uh, why some patients have aversion to certain foods after surgery. We see this quite often. Patients will come and tell us, uh, uh, doctor, there are foods that I used to love that I can't tolerate anymore, and vice versa. There are foods that I used to hate, and now I, I love them. And we always tell the patients, oh, it's because your taste buds are undergoing change or anything, or other things like that. And I believe that's essentially true, but uh, there are uh, very, uh, I think, complex mechanisms under this uh, change in taste and, uh, and food preferences that our patients go through. And I've got some of them listed here. We know that uh, there are various degrees of ketosis that the patients go into, and this can affect their acid-base balance and therefore uh, change the, uh, the milieu, if you will, of the taste buds. 
there is, of course, altered signaling that we're very familiar with the gut brain axis. There are, of course, the incretins and the gut hormones that change after surgery that might have an impact on food uh, and the appetite center and food preferences. Uh, we mentioned changes in the gut microbiome and, of course, uh, changes in levels and composition of bile acids, which was also just mentioned. There's an interesting study here that uh, comes from Malaysia, where they, uh, uh, it was a prospective study that included 90 patients. And what they did was uh, measure food tolerance, nutritional status, and quality of life data at baseline one month and three months after bariatric surgery. And uh, you can see there the estimated, sorry, the excess weight loss at one and three months, which was reasonable. Uh, and uh, the scoring system uh, uh, results are mentioned here, the food tolerance score, uh, 26 was the baseline. It actually dropped to 17, but then picked up again. It seems to be like a, a U-shaped curve there for both the food tolerance and the dietary intake. You can see that the calorie uh, amounts of calories uh, that uh, there's uh, there's a sharp dip in the calorie intake uh, after surgery that then slowly rises again and the quality of life as we know with our patients is consistently increased in most domains um, so you know uh, once we've um, ruled out that there's any serious anatomic problem and these patients are just undergoing a PO intolerance after bariatric surgery uh, for idiopathic reasons, I, I will often reassure the patients and tell them that they will probably do very well with the operation. Um, we find that these patients actually, once they overcome this difficult period of uh, chronic nausea or pain or food intolerance, actually do very well in the long term. And um, I just think maybe they are a little hypersensitive or super sensitive to all the hormonal mechanisms that take place as a result of metabolic surgery. And once again, thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to attend this very uh, uh, important event. Great. Thank you very much um, for those uh, fantastic presentations. I've spent a lot of time taking screenshots so um, to help teach my team members and my residents who may not have been able to participate this morning. Um, we have a lot of questions, so, um, and I know, Dr. Potty, you started to answer a few, but just in case, I may have you answer them uh, uh, um, over, you know, as, as we chat, too, just so that everybody can hear it if they're not seeing the chat. Um, but the first question is, um, patients with profound hypoglycemia preoperatively, um, how should uh, this change your decision? Um, and then kind of as part of it also, if they're on GLP agonists preoperatively with or without hypoglycemia, kind of both is what I was thinking, how does that affect decision-making from your perspective and those considerations for post-bariatric hypoglycemia? Oh, and Dr. Potty, you're still on mute. I think this is a really important question now that more and more people will be on GLP-1 agonists preoperatively. This actually came up for me uh, just two weeks ago, a patient who was having glucoses in the 50s um, on a GLP-1 agonist. Um, it makes me very nervous. Um, and I would say that it's sort of, I showed you how GLP-1 levels rise 20 fold after surgery. So if someone is having GLP-1 induced hypoglycemia preoperatively, you know, I think that's a pretty big red flag that they are probably, we don't know, but probably going to be at higher risk for postoperative hypoglycemia. So um, I would suggest that a patient like that get referred to an endocrinologist to make sure there's nothing else that might be contributing to the hypoglycemia. You know, do is their adrenal function normal? Are their meds, whatever? Um, and then I think the patient needs to sit down and really have a discussion of the risks of, and benefits. And if the patient and everyone else still wants to go ahead with surgery, um, then I would probably say we don't, you know, we can get hypoglycemia with both uh, sleeves and bypass and other procedures, but 
Um, I would probably pick sleeve since they tend to be a little bit less severe in terms of the hypoglycemia when it develops. But, you know, I, these patients with severe hypoglycemia can really, really impair quality of life. And I would really, it's obviously, there's no easy reversibility. So I would think hard about whether I wanted to have surgery or not, if it were me. Very fair question. Uh, I really appreciate that balanced approach. The um, uh, second question is, you mentioned lower BMI at the end of your presen uh, presentation as a risk factor for post-bariatric hypoglycemia. Um, and they asked about uh, body composition, if that's uh, part of your uh, workup, uh, or should we be doing body composition evaluations pre-surgically um, to help us understand outcomes, especially in this area? I think it's a, a great question. Um, we have never found any evidence really that adipose tissue or body composition is different in patients with and without hypoglycemia. And I would favor all of the evidence that we have in our research studies suggests that um, it's really the signals that are in the gut and the liver um, that are contributing to the pathophysiology here. And, and there's um, so I, I don't really think that the adipose composition is a big, um, a big part of this. So I, I don't know that that would help us really. It makes perfect sense. Um, Dr. Matar, uh, we had a question about, uh, well, a comment and a question about the placebo effect that uh, patients can have for uh, in the setting of a negative diagnostic laparoscopy, I think probably more for the chronic pain. Um, is there any study looking deeper into the placebo effects uh, for treating um, pain and oral intolerance after bariatric surgery? Uh, you know, <clears throat> this is a question that's bedeviled me ever since I was a fellow, and we noticed that patients would uh, suddenly feel better after a negative uh, uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. And we would often chalk it up to the fact that maybe there was a kink or the orientation of the intestines were probably abnormal. And, and just by running them, uh, because that's what we do with diagnostic laparoscopy, we run the entire length of the small bowel. Um, uh, it made them feel better. But as far as I'm, uh, I'm aware, I don't know if there's any protocolized study uh, that's undergoing to, uh, to study uh, the underlying mechanism for this. Great. If I may ask uh, Dr. Patty, uh, that that's a very that that question about the BCA, the body composition analysis, was uh, very intriguing, and it got me thinking. You know, we think in terms of adipose tissue, but what about muscle mass? Do patients who have varying degrees of muscle mass have varying degrees of hypoglycemia? Do you think because of the uptake of insulin? So no, you might, we, we suspected, and it would be logical to assume that patients who develop hypoglycemia are more insulin sensitive, but they're not. They're actually more insulin resistant. Um, uh, and so for example, if you think of, a, I would say a classic patient would be someone who has polycystic ovarian disease, no diabetes, but they're insulin resistant. That's the kind of patient that I think is at highest risk um, for um, hypoglycemia. I, I think we really need to develop better molecular markers that we could use preoperatively, but we're not there yet. But I, I just don't see any, ev I haven't seen any evidence um, that differences in body composition can explain. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions we have in our um, q and I've encountered nausea with vitamins and Actigol. Um, in your experience, how do you handle these patients? And admittedly, I think that could go for both uh, Dr. Potty and Dr. Matar. Uh, so I, I tend to be a little uh, slower in, uh, in initiating uh, postoperative vitamins. I, I'll usually let them uh, recover from surgery for a week or two before uh, introducing vitamins because patients' pouches and sleeves tend to be a little more sensitive at that time as they're healing. There's edema uh, and so on. Um, uh, and by and large, the nausea isn't necessarily from the individual vitamins themselves, but how they administer them. If they take too many at a time, the, the sheer volume of vitamin pills that they take can, can cause some uh, indigestion, so to speak, or nausea. 
Uh, as for Actigal, um, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the, the taste, uh, especially if we ask them to open big capsules, to take them that way can be a little uh, irritating. Um, but I believe that a lot of patients overcome these symptoms. They, they become more tolerant of them as time goes on. But uh, I'm interested to hear what uh, Dr. Patty might say about this. Well, you know, as I said, usually hypoglycemia doesn't develop for several years post-op, usually at least one year. So by the time I see the patients, the intolerance of their vitamins, it's really doesn't seem to be a big problem except for iron. You know, iron is always a problem. Um, so it, the big problem that I see in these later term patients is just that they've stopped taking them because mm -hmm. they're not going to the surgeon anymore. Um, they don't think it's necessary anymore. It's too expensive. I, I just sort of stopped. I got out of the habit. So I think it's um, and the primary care physicians who may be seeing the patients or may not aren't really um, emphasizing that enough with patients, how important it is for lifelong vitamins. So I, I think early on intolerance is certainly a problem. I agree. But then later it's more about other factors. Yeah. I think you hit on something really important where for accredited bariatric programs, we are supposed to see our patients lifelong but trying to get them to come back is a whole nother beast and a challenge. We send our patients, if they don't show up to appointments, uh, three letters, um, both via my chart, the EMR and certified letters. And we've gotten our follow-up rates at a year to about 40, almost 50%. Um, and that's good compared to other programs. At, by two years, we're down to 20% like everybody else, despite a significant workup. We've now started a campaign of a couple of years ago, sending letters to the primary care physicians as well saying, hey, haven't seen the patient. Do you mind sending us your notes? Here are the vitamins that we'd recommend and here are the levels we'd recommend checking. But that has also been, we've never gotten a, a we've done this for two years. We've never gotten a note back or any kind of follow-up. And so we've really struggled because I think you hit a point where we have, I'd be curious to hear if anybody's come up with a a technique that works because we're really interested and engaged to try to improve vitamin compliance specifically, at least that's on my part. And then nutrition compliance that I think can help long-term to avoid those simple carbs, but getting them to show up with our measures hasn't worked. Any ideas or thoughts there? Once I have patients with hypoglycemia, I tell them to go see their bariatric program again, but even that they're like, oh, why do I have to see them? I don't need more surgery. They don't understand that surgical care is not just about surgery. Yeah. And I, so I think that even if a primary care doctor says, oh, you should go see your surgeon, there's a lot of misconception out there that, you know, yeah. they just want to see me again to have more patients. I mean, it, it gets crazy like that, right? That, that yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's, it's Plus, an another factor is that we're handicapped by the insurance companies who will often tell patients we're, we're not going to cover vitamin uh, uh, lab measures uh, unless it's, it's, it's ordered by your uh, primary care provider. And mm -hmm. so, we, you know, we'll give them the list and send them here, take these to your doctor and have him order them. I mean, it's just crazy. That mm -hmm. is crazy. Yeah. More, more barriers. Um, I want to be respectful of the other questions that I know when I went off on a tangent, I apologize, but uh, please, uh, uh, there was a follow-up question, just understanding, wanting to understand how severe the risk of low BMI was for post-operative post -operative hypoglycemia. Is there kind of a, a range or a cutoff or kind of a, or is it just generally, it's just low BMI, it's higher risk? Yeah, um, I actually, I mean, that's been described in some studies and that's why I included it. But I think the people that are at the highest risk are the people that have high BMIs who haven't gotten diabetes. Mm -hmm. so, but, you know, all of our patients fall into these categories, right? I mean, we can't say, no, you can't have surgery because your BMI is too high and you don't have diabetes. That doesn't make any sense. Otherwise we wouldn't be treating anyone. So I think that the most important thing to think of in all of these lists is this question about preoperative history of hypoglycemia. And you have to ask patients and patients will say, yeah, when I was, you know, 20 years old, 
I was told I had reactive hypoglycemia. Did you tell your surgeon that? No, because I didn't think it was important. So you have to ask people and just ask them about simple question, any history of hypoglycemia in the past or suspicion that you might have a low blood sugar. Dr. Patty, do you think we're underutilizing continuous glucose monitoring preoperatively? Do you think, think that would be, be helpful? helpful? No. Okay. No, That's I don't think there's not. any evidence that that would be helpful because you've changed the anatomy so much postoperatively that, you know, you, you might have a perfectly normal CGM preoperatively and, you know, we're not measuring everything under the sun. And I just don't think that would be helpful. I'm just going to insert a quick question. I know we have a couple more, but um, I am dying to know because I am struggling with this myself. Preoperatively, we have a lot of patients on the GLP meds and I'm trying to figure out if I should stop them, when I should stop them. Should I restart them post-op? Uh, what are your thoughts on those meds with the timing of surgery? Are you talking to me? Dr. Patty, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... I certainly, you know, one of the, the biggest side effects of this group of medicines as a class is nausea. And so I certainly would favor stopping them postoperatively because that's just complicating things. And, you know, the bariatric surgery itself should be much more potent than the medications to achieve what we're looking for. So I would stop it. Now, that being said, I have patients who are you know, three years post-op and they're gain, they've regained weight or their diabetes control is suboptimal and I'll restart GLP-1 agonist then. But I, I wouldn't in the, you know, for first six months, probably. I'm just saying that I don't have a number that is based on any data. But right now I stop them a week pre-op, but I'm not sure uh, that there's any true data also, for that. Yeah. It depends also on which one, you know, I think that's a reasonable approach. There's just no data, but it seems yeah. reasonable. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, does pre-op NPO, and uh, this may be out of Dr. Potty's uh, area of expertise, but let's ask it to the whole group. Uh, being um, NPO or nothing per, um, per Oz, uh, same day for same day operations or for surgery contribute to post-op post-op hypoglycemia? Um, yeah, we've often suspected that here. And this is why we now have adopted ERAS uh, protocols that call for a, a carbohydrate load uh, before surgery, uh, a small one. We feel that this actually uh, reduces stress by tempering any hypoglycemia tendencies. In our patients, we've suspected that many of them have undiagnosed hypoglycemia in the early postoperative period. Well, I, I just want to make a comment that postoperative hypoglycemia, which is occurring in the setting of being NPO and sick and everything else, is not the same as what we're talking about. Right. Post bariatric, right? Post bariatric hypoglycemia starts usually at least a year out, so it's a it's a completely different ball game and a different mechanism entirely. So yes, you can have hypoglycemia in the periop period, but that's not necessarily in any way related to the subsequent disease. It's not a disease. Yeah. yeah. Any, um, you know, we've had a fantastic discussion and we have a minute left for finishing up somewhat on time, but in the last minute, any questions, comments from um, either uh, Dr. Jane Spangler, Dr. Potty, Dr. Matar, um, before we wrap up the morning. I say this every month, but um, we didn't have this when I was a fellow. And I am just so thankful that we were able to develop this and have this in your expertise and your many, many, many years of contributing to this bill um, are super appreciated. So thank you both so much for taking the time this morning. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I wish I had thought of this when I was in the leadership. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, for my the email. Uh, let me just. Uh... Dr. Prady, keep going. Sorry. I was just going to say thank you for doing this. Yeah. Uh, fantastic discussion. I've learned so much this morning. Absolutely. Um, Y'all have a wonderful morning. Enjoy the OR and or clinic and or education. Have a great thank day, you. everybody. Bye. Hello, everyone. Um, Dr. Lloyd here. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank 
both of our speakers for giving such wonderful talks. Um, Dr. Matar, I know Dr. Patty is not here as well, but I feel like I learned so much today from listening to both of you guys. I had all these questions about hypoglycemia after surgery, and I feel like Dr. Patsy literally hit every single one of them because um, I've had a couple of patients in the past with just trying to figure them out. It seems like Dr. Matar, you will be fielding all the afternoon questions for now. <laughs> which is totally fine. So I will start off with one. Um, so I recently had a patient who uh, had food intolerance um, after having had surgery. And I felt like it was, uh, you know, kind of a difficult process for me, just kind of um, figuring out, making sure there were no anatomical or technical reasons that um, the patient was having these issues, but also, um, you know, just making sure that everything was going well with her. So my question to you is, at what point would you recommend actually bringing in the outside specialist and having this multidisciplinary uh, meeting that you proposed? Right. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, I think every practice or every physician should have some kind of process in place or a protocol for this special population. And uh, obviously, once... Once you've completed all the uh, investigations and feel comfortable, feel assured that there is no anatomical underlying mechanism that is driving the process, um, then, um, and after trying um, several different uh, strategies for, uh, for uh, helping with the nausea or the PO intolerance, and she's still refractory to it, or he are refractory to it, that's when I would call, I would call the multidisciplinary team uh, to discuss her. Samer, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you can, can hear me. Oh, yes, How, you know, thank How are you? you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. I truly enjoyed the talk. I think the one thing that... Uh, uh, the fellows probably uh, appreciate is uh, those kind of talks that are very uh, practical, something that you can use in your practice on a day-to-day -day basis, not really a list of the, uh, literature. It's more of a uh, you know, logical, practical approach to taking care of those patients because, you know, and I know we've seen many issues like that in our practice, and many, many of us have developed uh, based on experience and published data, more of a compassionate, logical approach to taking care of those patients. And so I want to thank you for that. And I agree with you 100%. When uh, we see patients like that in the practice, there's lots of hand holding uh, that goes into this. Um, and uh, what patients need for the most part, especially early on, is the uh, kind of support uh, that you uh, uh, talked about and the continuous follow-up. And I usually tell the patient when I see patients with PO intolerance, chronic nausea, uh, issues like that, that I'm going to continue to see you personally on a weekly basis until you feel better. And we're lucky that we have an infusion center uh, uh, as part of our practice, and we do use IV infusion, vitamin infusion, and IV infusion. Uh, sometimes people get into that vicious cycle of dehydration, chronic nausea, and vomiting. And the minute they get some IV uh, and fluid, they feel, uh, they feel better. So I, I'm glad uh, that you spoke about that. But I have a question for you, and I think it's more of a, a practical question uh, for the fellows, because I'm sure every one of us have seen uh, some PO intolerance, chronic nausea and vomiting after sleeve gastrectomies in the absence of any anatomical issue. Um, and it seems to be more common in sleep patients compared to gastric bypass patients. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, it may be the high pressure system. Maybe there's some component of sleep migration into the hiatus or even a small component of functional obstruction with the gastric pouch immediately afterward. But uh, I'm sure you've seen patients like that as well. Chronic nausea and vomiting, PO intolerance dry heaving with negative upper endoscopy, negative upper GI, and some of those patients end up on PPN for a week or two, and then they turn the corner after that with some supportive measures. Uh, can you comment on those patients, especially yeah. now that the sleeve is becoming the most commonly performed procedure? Yeah, thank you, Meher, and I really admire the fact that instead of distancing yourself from these complex patients, complex and demanding patients, you actually embrace them 
and uh, you get to see them more often because these patients, they know that they're not following the typical path. And I feel that they feel more uh, assured that um, and secure that you are actually uh, staying close to them. With regards to a sleeve gastrectomy patients, you're right. I have noticed that patients who have undergone the sleeve gastrectomy uh, tend to have a little more um, uh, incidence of this PO intolerance than others. Uh, but I've noticed that uh, the, the typical patients tend to be younger females and surprisingly, who have uh, milder BMIs. They're usually patients with a BMI between 35 and 45 for some reason. And like I said, in the younger age group. And uh, of course, we've already established uh, by definition that there are no anatomical abnormalities here. We have already checked their hiatus. We've checked the esophagus. we checked the sleeve. Personally, I think that these are patients who are very sensitive to the surges in GLP-1 that happen. We all know that the, that the effect of the sleeve on appetite is actually more powerful than the gastric bypass. I mean, at, at least that's what I gather from the patients. And I just feel that these are patients who are experiencing an over uh, expression of the effects of the, of, of the, of the hormonal changes that happen with sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, and the proof of that is that once they become tolerant to it, or and once they become accustomed to it, they turn a corner. And uh, this is why I tell them that they actually, uh, this is a sign that they're going to benefit a lot from this operation because it's actually working very well for them. The, the yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I is that, that. The, effect of, uh, the effect of GLP-1 is like on a spectrum that goes from no effect to uh, uh, terrible nausea. And in the middle is the soft sweet spot where you want patients to be, where they have anorexia, uh, but without nausea. And that's, uh, that's not always the case. Some patients are more towards the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, and that's a very interesting observation because uh, based what uh, we see in our practice, those patients tend to get better around like week three or week four. Uh, right. So the fourth week, they start turning the corner and that's when we start taking them off TPN. But the other thing I want to mention, it's more of an anecdotal experience where there's no data to suggest that. I've seen some of those patients get better uh, with just empiric dilatation of the EGJ. Uh, some of those patients end up going to GI, GI do the endoscopy and they call us to say, you know what? I didn't see anything. Everything looks good. There's no hernia. There's no uh, a, a stricture. There's no uh, Shatsky's ring or anything like that. But I decided to dilate the EGJ anyways because the patient is having nausea and dysphagia. And sometimes they do get better. And that yeah. makes me think, are we missing something? Because uh, obviously we don't do any kind of like pre-op manometry on those patients. Um, so I don't know if those patients maybe have a problem like a hypertonic LES or maybe high IRP, but obviously we don't know that because we don't study those patients. So we're very interested now at our institution into using the end of flip, which is new technology we're looking into. So maybe when I scope those patients, post-op patients who have, and I'm talking uh, not only C, but also bypass patients, we have dysphagia post up dysphagia, no evidence of stricture, no evidence of ulcer, no evidence of hernia, no Shatsky ring, no esophagitis, none of that. You know, we've ruled all these things out, but we can do at the same time, we can do an end of flip, look at the racks, look at the DI, at the EGJ, and see if there's a, uh, a narrowing or functional obstruction at the EGJ and then dilate at that time. So there's something, just one thing I wanted to mention because we're looking into it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're looking into that. You'll notice in my second slide, when I said dilatation, I wrote there empiric dilatation because with endoscopy, sometimes just instrumenting the patient, instrumentation of the patient, whether it's through endoscopy or a diagnostic laparoscopy, it can have, you know, very uh, positive uh, effects. And the patients feel that they, there's this placebo effect that we still don't understand. I'm happy to see that Dr. Patty has joined us. Hello. Yeah, absolutely. 
Thanks for joining us, Dr. Patty. Um, just one comment about what Mahara was just talking about. Um, so I've seen that in my practice as well, you know, a couple of patients that we've had to do placebo or empiric dilation on, and it's really just fascinating that they all feel better afterwards, even though there isn't much um, of a stricture or stenosis that the GI guys see. Um, so I, I don't know, I wonder if there is some functional components and I'm curious to see what you find. Um, but again, Dr. Patty, welcome to the conversation. We already have a couple of questions from the audience for you. Um, I thought your presentation was, was awesome. I was saying before you joined that um, I had all these questions about hypoglycemia in patients because I've seen it myself. Um, but we'll start with a question from um, the audience here asking, what is the role of SGTL2 in um, PBH? And um, what dose of GLP-1 would you use on these patients? Um, well, I'm, I'm not 100% clear about your question. Um, I think we have an echo on you, yeah. No, she's muted. So you're muted in both spots now. Okay, how about this? Perfect. Okay. Perfect, we can um, hear you now. Okay, so um, there's two different drug classes that were mentioned in the question. Uh, the first, so first of all, the first line agent I really still think should be uh, dietary changes um, and then a carbose because this is the lowest risk um, and best targeted um, and best understood approach. Um, uh, there's been no clinical trial using GLP-1 receptor agonists um, to demonstrate efficacy, but anecdotally, a, a number of case reports and clinician experience has uh, demonstrated that some patients do benefit from GLP-1 receptor um, agonists, potentially via their effect to reduce appetite and delay gastric emptying, but it's not entirely clear. Um, so if we're starting on uh, GLP-1 agonists, you know, really the choice of which drug would depend on what the insurance coverage is. Um, I've seen some effect in people on weekly Trulicity or Ozempic. Um, I don't have enough experience yet with Trisepatide. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's really a question of gradual titration. The biggest side effect would be nausea that a lot of these people may be um, more likely to experience. Um, uh, but it, it does, uh, it, in some patients, it stabilizes glucose. However, at the same time, um, in some patients, GLP-1 agonists make hypoglycemia worse. Um, so you really have to individualize and explain to patients that you're doing a trial, uh, a test run on this drug, and we have to see how you respond. And because otherwise, um, you, you just can't predict from an individual patient. So that's um, GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors, um, there's one very small study where it, there was some evidence that it was effective. Um, it may be, the efficacy may be in part related to inhibition of SGLT1 in the intestine and reduction in glucose absorption by that mechanism. Um, my, only, uh, my only caveat with using SGLT2 inhibitors is that uh, they can cause dehydration quite substantially. And a lot of these individuals that I see who have PBH are already on either they have mild volume depletion. They may be orthostatic from uh, either volume depletion or from autonomic neuropathy. And so um, SGLT2 inhibitors can be problematic from that standpoint. So I'm a little bit more cautious there, but it's something that can be tried if people have failed other things. Dr. Patty, it's uh, Dr. Elchar. I truly enjoyed your talk. I love the fact how you made a very complicated topic very uh, simple and easy. So I'm sure the fellows have enjoyed the talk and have learned something. I have two quick questions for you. Um, and uh, the first one is more of a comment. I always um, wondered if the PBH that you're talking about is a, a, uh, similar to the late dumping. You know, we always talk about early dumping and late dumping. And the pathophysiology of late dumping, at least the way I look at it, is very similar to PBH and hypoglycemia. So, uh, if you have a comment on that, 
Uh, and the other question in terms of the hypoglycemia is the some of the autonomic dysfunction that we see patients. So I was very interested um, to listen to your lecture and learn that there's also some autonomic dysfunction because of hypoglycemia. So do you believe that the autonomic dysfunction that we see in some of our patients, including hypotension, is truly related to hypoglycemia itself? I, I, I think that's a, an awesome question, but I can't answer the question for you because we just don't know. It's, um, so most of the time when you talk about hypoglycemia associated autonomic neuropathy, you're talking about the autonomic response to hypoglycemia. So uh, we know that recurrent hypoglycemia, like in patients with diabetes, um, can induce um, a reduction in autonomic responses to hypoglycemia. But the autonomic neuropathy that we see in patients with PBH is much, is different from that. And it extends to multiple organ systems, not only the gut, but also the urinary tract, as well as the orthostasis. Um, so um, I, I think that my suspicion, and that's all it is at this point, is that in the patients with PBH who have autonomic dysfunction, it's not solely due to the um, hypoglycemia, but probably is also a consequence of um, uh, surgery-associated neuropathy that could be nutritional in origin, but that's really my suspicion at this point. I, I don't have proof of that. Um, and then your other question was what? What was delayed dumping? Do you oh, think yeah, like yeah, this yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is truly like yeah. what we know as surgeons as yeah. late dumping? Yeah. I think it's a spectrum for sure. I think that a lot of the pathophysiology of dumping, both early and late, relates to early nutrient um, delivery to the intestine and secretion of all these peptides, including GLP-1 and others, as you all know. Um, but, you know, a lot of patients who present with hypoglycemia, let's say two or three years after surgery, they don't have any of the early dumping symptoms. Um, they may not have any postprandial diarrhea or lightheadedness or anything else, and they just have hypoglycemia as their only manifestation of, of dumping. So, um, you know, why is that? Um, I don't know, have they lost, uh, have they adapted to some of the uh, early postprandial symptoms? I honestly can't say. Um, we've looked at, in research studies, we've looked at dumping scores in patients with and without hypoglycemia, uh, and patients, all of whom have had surgery, either with hypoglycemia or without match for duration and everything, and we don't see a difference in dumping scores as a, you know, the, the classic dumping score that assesses change in volume, like increases in pulse, changes in hematocrit. So um, I think that people can have hypoglycemia without the other parts of dumping. And I, I don't, but I still think it's a spectrum. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. I, I think it's a good answer, but you're breaking up late dumping yeah sorry can you hear me now um, yeah. basically what you're trying to say is that the path of is dumping and uh, physiology but the symptoms may be different yeah I, I think that's a fair statement there are some people who don't have early dumping but have isolated hypoglycemia and even if you ask them in retrospect, did you ever have early dumping symptoms? And you describe that to them and they're like, no, I've never had that. So I think that personal perception is also variable. Dr. Yeah, Pat, you. You, you mentioned um, a couple of risk factors as well for patients who um, are you know, more likely to develop the hypoglycemia after surgery. And in particular, you said that we should ask patients um, if they've had previous episodes. Um, does this mean that it's potentially a disqualifying feature for some patients if they present and want to undergo a run like gastric bypass? Well, I, I think it just should be in the equation. I'm not saying that I'm never, I would never say never um, because it's just a risk factor. We all know that risk doesn't equal disease, right? Um, but I would be uh, cautious and I might have a good uh, conversation with the patient about the choice of procedure. Um, if somebody truly had a history that sounded like hypoglycemia, 
I don't think that I would be really excited to do a gastric bypass. I might, uh, people do get hypoglycemic after sleep, but it tends to be a little bit less intense. Um, and so, you know, if they still wanted to go ahead with surgery, I'd probably favor thinking about a sleeve rather than a, um, than a bypass. Um, so there's no easy answer for sure. Um, and a lot of times people will say they have symptoms of hypoglycemia. Um, but if you, if somebody says they have hypoglycemia or they've had symptoms that they thought they might have, I think that they deserve to have an endocrine workup before surgery to make sure there's nothing else that's going on. You know, could they have adrenal insufficiency? Could they have um, something else that's contributing to their hypoglycemia? I think that should be identified preoperatively and then a decision made based on risk benefit analysis. And it's gonna be different for everybody. Absolutely. Um, all right, it seems like we are actually out of time. I don't know if you have any pressing questions, Amahar, but I think we've covered all the ones from the audience. You're thank missing. you, Judy. I just want to say uh, thank you, Dr. Mutar, Dr. Patty. This was um, amazing lectures, very practical. I'm hoping the fellows have learned something today because I know I did. Yeah, thank today was great. Thank you to both of you guys for taking I the time. Too. Oh, sorry. I was saying I learned a lot too today. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Patty. Oh, my pleasure. All right, you guys have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you. <laughs>